Am I still there? Hi, everyone, and welcome. We have a video to start. Uh, we'll give it a minute to play that. Okay, maybe, maybe the video isn't playing. We'll see if we can bring that back later. Uh, but anyway, uh, thank you all for coming. We welcome everyone to Roydin Likini Philanthropies' inaugural track for Charcha 2021. And I'm very grateful to all of you who have taken a substantial chunk of time out from your busy days to spend it with us on this journey over the next three days. Like the opening panel echoed, if there is one thing we have all learned over the past year, it is how interconnected we are and how visible this web has been made. We saw, cheered, and learned from the importance of horizontal solidarity of ordinary citizens when faced with the pandemic. Citizens were first responders, even as markets and states were limited in their ability to respond to the planetary scale and speed of the crisis. This idea that every problem is solvable and that every individual and organization can contribute to such change, as we saw it expressed in the early responses to the pandemic, is central to the odyssey of learning we're on with a remarkable set of organizations engaged in the practice of active citizenship and public, public problem solving. We have learned so much from them and that there is always more than one path to achieve systemic change and that meaningful solutions emerge only through co-creation. Converge, converging crises or syndemics, as I've learned they are called, require converging solutions that are unified but never uniform. This is why we are deeply invested in the idea of active citizenship and the emergent resilient societies it enables. And this is our invitation to all of you over the next three days. We cannot do it alone and we cannot do it without embracing a deep curiosity to explore participatory systemic change. We have an exciting lineup for the next few days, ranging from funders to movie makers, to grassroots media organizations, to politicians. Without further ado, let me move into our first panel with the team at Arete Advisors. We have Anurathi and Shraddha who join us. But before I do, a few short housekeeping rules. This session will run for 50 minutes. There are two windows, a chat window for conversations, which we encourage. Please feel free to ask questions, drop comments in, and a Q&A window for explicit questions that you would like uh, Anurathi and Shraddha to, to, to answer. Ask your questions throughout the conversation and note that you can upvote questions to prioritize them. We'll take questions in the last 10 minutes of the session. Before I introduce the team from Areke, I wanted to give you some context on why we wanted to do this report. Over the last few years, we have come to see an incredible diversity and vibrant set of practices around the idea of active citizenship and public problem solving. Indeed, central to the idea that communities can be the heroes of their own stories. Indeed, that citizens can participate in problem solving and not merely receive governance, but co-create good governance. This is what we wanted to synthesize, both the theory of it as well as the practice of it. We also wanted to capture the field and cast of actors in this landscape, and that's what we will present to you today. Shraddha, over to you. Thank you uh, for that wonderful uh, introduction, uh, Gautam. Um, I just want to start just take a moment to say that it's really been a very enriching personally to work in this space while like i think we're all citizens and therefore the space is very very intuitive uh, to all of us but i think it's also a very nebulous uh, sector or space to think about you know trying to tie theory and practice uh, together we got to interact with some wonderful organizations, both within the RNP portfolio as well as outside the portfolio, that are trying to kind of bring, let's say, the theory, the concepts into action and uh, see how change happens on the ground when we uh, enable communities. Uh, when we started uh, thinking about, uh, you know, like how should Arite go, like how do we go about capturing the broader landscape? Uh, we kind of, I think we, I, uh, we started with five uh, research questions. Uh, Yash, could you move to the next slide, please? And uh, these are uh, uh, these were the five uh, key questions I think that we thought that the report should try and answer. One is like, what is active citizenship and is it different from uh, citizenship? 
how does active citizenship really enable uh, resilient societies and what does the indian active citizenship space look like at least as of let's say if i were to say at this moment in time what does the landscape look like who are the different actors uh, in this space and how do they engage and where do they play and what are the forces that are shaping the work in this space and last obviously where do we go uh, from here and i think gautam you've alluded uh, to one and two uh, in your uh, introduction and setting up the context for what the track is about i will not spend a lot of time uh, talking about those but today i want to kind of uh, talk to our audience about questions 3 4 and 5 uh, and uh, kind of walk you through on what have like what are the things that we have learned uh during uh, uh our research and are continuing to learn as we polish and finalize the report and our i think I, if i were to just articulate a one line what is our broad uh what is our big goal uh for today it is to just kind of bring to the surface how uh nuanced and complex and multidimensional the work in the citizenship and governance space is uh we've uh, like we looked at, at literature uh, around governance democracy citizenship uh, uh extensively both within uh, originating from india as well as uh, outside india and we also looked at like let's the landscape of organizations working in this space we did a deep uh, dive on about 50 of those organizations to kind of bring together what uh, citizenship in action uh, looks like and while i think the broader ecosystem would be upwards of 400 to 500 organizations who are doing some very meaningful work uh next slide please and uh i come from a, a, a corporate uh, background so i think the who are the stakeholders and what are their motivations is kind of embedded in my own personal first principles thinking and that's how we kind of approach the research problem as well uh we initially started with the hypothesis that if we kind of look at just samaj we will be able to arrive at a uh you know a good uh, comprehensive picture of what the landscape looks like but very quickly into our research we realized that that will not present uh, the complete picture and like the system as a whole like is a delicate ba balance between samaj sarkar and uh uh bazaar and the field is extremely wide it draws not just from governance and democracy it draws from public policy it draws from political economy it draws from sociology and anthropology and also like it speaks to the very core of who we are as individuals our identity and our agency and uh, therefore like we this like we went back to the rnp uh, framing of samaj sarkar and bazaar being like the key uh, foundational pillars i think and kind of looked at uh, how they are enabled by a whole host of actors right while sarkar obviously is the may, one of the primary actors in this ecosystem since they are responsible for uh, governance and it's in the sarkar's interest as well to kind of engage uh, citizens and uh, we thought about bazaar initially our hypothesis was to think of bazaar essentially in the funding context but as we delve deeper we realized that bazaar itself has a lot of incentive to be a good citizen and that i think is reflecting in a lot of the louder conversations we're hearing around sustainability around uh, esg around business for good and uh, these three are like supported immensely by a whole host of uh, enabling actors whether it's technology which is really really disrupting both our lives as like individuals as well as like institutionally on how we engage with uh, different sectors uh, funders whether it's knowledge research just building like the knowledge in the field whether it's the justice system or it's media which kind of plays a huge role in both uh democratizing information as well as power to some extent by holding the government accountable and acting as a watchdog and i think here gotham like it would be great to hear from you on how do you see the active citizenship portfolio and like what is uh, the nilakani philanthropy's uh thinking around uh active citizenship and how it plays 
into the whole Samaj, Sarkar and Bazaar dynamic. Thank you, Shadda, for that uh, overview of how, how, how we've been approaching this research. Um, something that um, both Mr. Kant and Rohini mentioned in the um, opening plenary was how Samaj is the first sector. And I think it's important for us to anchor this work in that. We, we believe that uh, Samaj is the first sector and that Samaj created both Bazaar and Sarkar for its own welfare. So in that sense, what Samaj is also has to do as part of that compact is hold it both accountable to what we call the public good. Um, indeed, our endeavor is to create a good and just society, and we believe that anchoring all of this work in the strength and power of Samaj is important. Um, many years ago, uh, you know, Rohini had in, in one of her talks had made this statement about how good governance is not something um, that 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 we should good governance is not something that we should ask for. It is something that citizens need to co-create. And I think that was the start of this journey. Um, how do citizens participate in solving the problem of the public, um, in so public problem solving around, it doesn't matter whether it's at the level of um, your, your street, your city, um, or your nation state, but the idea that the engagement and participation on citizens is vital, not just along the electoral cycle, but in the daily experience of governance. Indeed, to co-create governance and to co-create solutions to, to our problems. Uh, that was kind of the genesis of this work of active citizenship. Um, and also to distinguish our role as citizens from that of, say, us as customers of a market or subjects of a state. The anchoring of this work is in that identity. Uh, is in the identity of allowing individuals and you know civil society organizations and indeed Samaj to be uh, or to be able to be the heroes of its own stories rather than expect others, whether it's the uh, Sarkar or Bazaar, only to solve all of all all, all the problems that we face. Uh, there is of course a more cross-cutting theme. We are all citizens. Um, whether, whether, for example, um, we work in Samaj, Sarkar, or Bazaar, we have a fundamental identity as citizens. And sometimes solving our problems, where we can transcend the hats we wear and reclaim the fundamental hats of citizenship uh, and, neighbor, and, 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 and you know, neighborliness to, 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 to co-create solutions to our problems. Uh, so that's where we actually uh, started this work. And then, of course, over the last few years, we've seen the tremendous ability of technology to both uh, amplify and impede some of these journeys. And so we've been doing some work along with others to kind of unpack and uh, understand the role of technology in this, uh, the role of movement building, the role of amplification and knowledge and all of these enabling pieces. And what we see is this very, very vibrant landscape that we can all build, build from um, and fundamentally upholding this role of ours as active citizens in a dynamic republic and in a participatory democracy. So that's where we come from. And we've been really fortunate to work with an amazing set of actors across a range of geographies and areas of work and interest and in using different methodologies uh, to be able to give voice and uh, demonstrate the practice of active citizenship in public problem solving. Um, I know you'll have a much, de much more detailed unpacking of this as we go ahead. So um, Anurathi and Shraddha, if you'd like to go to that. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Gautam. That was uh, really nuanced. Um, I, just to go from here, I think while we will be focusing a lot of our conversation on the role of Samaj and many of the sessions that follow uh, our session today will delve deeper uh, into some of uh, the themes, uh, but we will be discussing this confluence of Samaj uh, with Sarkar and Bazaar in great detail in three other sessions uh, one is when we look at technology uh, and active citizenship, which is the session called uh, Citizenship as a Service. Then we have a session from a funder's perspective on how they think about funding uh, work uh, in this space, which is called Lift Karade. And then our session, Uncommon Ground, uh, will uh, delve deeper into how like, we can maintain uh, this balance uh, between Samaj, Sarkar and Bazaar. And today, just following uh, this session, we have Hansel Mehta, who's a filmmaker, and Anushka Shah uh, talking about films and active uh, citizenship. And then later, we have uh, Barkha Dutt, uh, Meera Devi, and Dhanya Rajendran speaking uh, on media and its role in active citizenship. Uh, Yash, could we please go to the next slide? Uh, before uh, I think we kind of uh, start unpacking our findings, I just wanted to give everybody a lay of the land, uh, uh, so to speak. 
uh, we've built on the framework uh, that uh, Rohini Nilkani Philanthropies and APTI Institute uh, kind of formulated in their report on technology in the service of citizenship, which came out last year, which kind of looked at citizenship, active citizenship across five uh, dimensions on how citizens transact with the government. These are volunteering, co-creation, electoral participation, claim making and movement building. Volunteering is essentially when we give our resources and time and effort uh, to a cause or to a CSO. And usually this is without uh, expectation of payment. Co-creation is like what got the mention, right? Like when we take ownership of our communities and don't necessarily look towards Sarkar or Bazaar to solve our problems, and we are solving our own community's problems, that's co-creation. Electoral participation, I think we all understand intuitively. That's one of the rights, I think, which is intricately tied with the concept of citizenship. Then there is claim making where we are asserting our voice uh, and claiming our rights or entitlements from the government through systems and processes. And then there's movement building where, you know, like we're kind of voicing our opinions over policy changes that are coming in or any laws that are being announced. And I think some of this has been very, very uh, real and uh, for a lot of us, over the last 18 to 24 months. And I think when we kind of started delving deeper, we realized that probably these are not watertight uh, compartments. Uh, they, it is a spectrum and they, they all kind of uh, bleed into each other and draw from uh, each other as well. What we did uh, was that we layered two questions on this framework on saying, what is the power dynamic between the citizen and the government across each of these five di dimensions when they transact with each other. And the second, we looked at what were the incentives for citizens and government to engage with each other. And then like this whole incentives and power uh, dynamic construct, how does it influence the work that organizations are trying to do uh, in this uh, 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 sector? So with that, uh, let me uh, hand over to Anurati who will now walk us all through some of the findings. Anurati, over to you. Also, for everyone in the audience, just to note, there is a polls tab, and we will be running polls there. If you go on over to it, um, Anurati has one lined up for you. Thank you, Shraddha. Thank you, Gautam. Um, we thought that we would actually kick off this piece on uh, the role of uh, on really kind of unpacking and deconstructing um, what the the CSOs and social enterprises are doing with a quick poll. Um, can I request, uh, Kriti, can you launch the poll, please? We'll give it 20 seconds to launch. I know we're all struggling with a new platform. Oh, there it is. Um, <clears throat> it'll be really interesting to hear because uh, I think when the Ariri team really started looking at this space, uh, I think we came from some preconceived notions of what we would see. And um, so it's, we're very curious to hear um, from the audience. As you take the poll, just a reminder that you can uh, put questions in the Q&A box and upvote existing questions uh, if you feel strongly about any one of them. I think we'll give it maybe another 20 seconds and then we can publish the results. Should we um, see where we are? And I hope I can. So, Anurathi, there's a clear winner on this one. Uh, volunteering has nearly 50% oh, of the in... vote, followed by uh, co-creation at about 30%. See the screen. 
15, I can see a 14% somewhere. So movement building is at 14%. Co-creation is at about 29%. Claim making at about 15%. Um, and the is, winner I'm is... I'm not actually able to... Did we just lose? Yeah, yeah, I yeah, think, I think so. you did. Yeah, but uh, this is uh, the results are a little uh, in line with what I think uh, as Arita we also went in with where we did think. I'm surprised that the audience didn't think electoral participation, but our hypothesis was that like we would see a lot of people uh, working in uh, community organization, organizing like getting people out to vote and uh, volunteering. Uh, but uh, that's not the case. Uh, and we'll find out. Yash, could we uh, go to the next slide, please? Yeah. All right. I actually, I'm going to wait for a couple of seconds for Anurithi to join back. I can see that Nikhil has a question uh, uh, for us and I will try and answer that question. It's a very interesting question saying, you know, where do you think policy think tanks or impact consulting firms, uh, where do they fit and where do impact investors fit? I think this is a great question, Nikhil. And to, to answer it, I think what like you will realize, like, I don't know if you noticed, but knowledge, I think, is a key uh, enabler for this space. And as a, like uh, while the research is really vast, uh, I, I also and and it's multi sectoral, multi dimensional. I do think there's still a dearth of actionable research uh, in the sector. We like just before Chacha last week, we did an internal convening of, uh, uh, at R and P with the portfolio, and I think one of like the big uh, issues that came up uh, in that discussion was what does impact even look like? What does success look like in this space? And I think this is where a lot of the actors that you've mentioned kind of come in and like they're helping build the knowledge both in the space and also uh, the impact investors obviously are providing a much more patient uh, capital than let social equity would look like. Uh, so yeah, they, they're playing very important roles uh, in this space. I think Anurati is back. I am. I am. I was waiting for one of us to some some kind of strong te technical glitch. Um, just wanted to, uh, Shada, where did we get to? No, we we just uh, I took a question from Nikhil. Uh, so yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, we we'll give this another shot. So um, we really started um, the way we actually got into this uh, piece, and like Shada mentioned. We started working on this, uh, thinking that you know Samaj would really give us a big answer, and so we explored actually uh, a group of about fifty or so CSOs and social enterprises, um, and this was based. We came up with a list based on some extensive secondary research, and we actually through our conversations with the portfolio, um, we were able to um, you know add, edit, and remove, and it we were very interested to really see what. Um, kind of work the organizations were doing. And I think the reason we wanted to actually share this with you is to give a flavor of really how deep and, and textured the work is, right? Um, I also want to just reiterate um, a point that Shraddha and Gautam have made, which is that um, none of this is kind of set in stone. Uh, and so we really do encourage people to come in with um, you know, different discussion points and debate on some of these pieces. So uh, to start with, I think, you know, co-creation was really, really prominent. Um, I think uh, almost 50% of the organizations were working through the space. And this was a particularly interesting insights uh, insight for us because I think at least I personally had gone in thinking that you know something like claim making would probably be more prominent. Um, when we actually dissected co-creation further, we saw a couple of threads emerging. Right. Um, so one was saying there was a bunch of work, and nearly 50% of uh, of these organizations were working in capacity development through leadership. Um, and there was a very wide variety of work happening here. So you have organizations like Koro, uh, which are doing work on grassroots leadership development. And then you have organizations like the Indian School of Democracy, which are building uh, leaders for politics. Um, 
and they did this leadership development um, through different kinds of domain uh, experience with domain building with knowledge building through building career capital um, for the leaders they were working with um, there is another kind of interesting segment which is speaking to information um, and research um, and this goes a little bit beyond um, uh, so, of course, there are organizations like CPR, uh, like Oxfam, that are doing a lot of core policy work. But we also saw some very interesting players uh, who were really working on sharing information. So I think uh, a conversation on a player which has really stuck with us is uh, we spoke with Volti Band, um, which is a part, it is, is a part of the RNP portfolio. And they have do this incredible work on trying to reduce the I guess to reduce the binary, the growing binaries um, in the world today, and to really enable people to speak to each other. Um, so they create conversations and forums that make this happen. I think the third part within um, co-creation, uh, which is probably the smallest bucket, is on actually layering infrastructure or layering public goods under what the government does. Um, and a very clear example of this, of course, is uh, the EGA Foundation, uh, which really, uh, really works on digitizing government processes uh, in many ways so that um, uh, so that it essentially, you know, they have many dimensions of their work, but a, a key part of it is to say, how do we save on uh, create efficiencies and save time um, so that a lot of grievances and other reversals can happen immediately. Um, so this was what we discovered on the co-creation piece. We did have some, we had an internal convening some time ago, and one of the questions that really came up was, you know, why is there not more layering and why are there not more government good, uh, public goods being made? And I think there's many answers to it, but uh, probably one of them, and we'd love to hear from uh, from the audience on this as well, but one of them is probably around the challenges of, of you know, a common good which, which needs to be really created um, for everyone and not just a specific audience. Um, the second big piece uh, is claim making. Um, and claim making is really what Shraddha had called, which is uh, asking the government uh, for what is uh, for what uh, our rights are. And um, there's kind of, I would say, two or there are many ways in which, of course, this also happens. But two prominent threads that we saw, there was a lot of work doing on making uh, on making or the right to information process more efficient. Um, and then there is a very interesting model on claiming welfare schemes from the government. So Hak Darshak, of course, is a very interesting example of this, where they go, um, for those who don't know the model, they actually go uh, work in communities to ensure that citizens are able to get uh, um, through Hak Darshak, uh, through people from the communities employed to make sure that they get um, access to the welfare schemes they deserve. Um, there are three other um, kind of slightly smaller um, uh, clusters for us to discuss. Volunteering is a very intuitive one. Um, this is a this has been a very neutral way through which people have really showcased citizenship for a long time. Uh, it's also an interesting one because uh, in many ways it has least. Um, uh, it can actually have minimal uh, interface with the government. So a lot of volunteering that takes place is, um, you know, citizen to citizen groups. Uh, the innovation that we are really seeing here around civil society organizations is in finding that many of them uh, are trying to institutionalize the process, right? So you'll have I volunteer, which has created an interface um, or a marketplace where people looking to volunteer their skills and those, um, uh, it's essentially a marketplace. Um, another, um, another option or a really uh, another interesting one, of course, has been REAP Benefit. Um, REAP Benefits um, has used some of their volunteers to actually create tech infrastructure uh, for organizations to work with. Um, there are two last pieces to talk about here. Uh, electoral participation, we were actually really interested to see that there were fewer organizations that were working in this space. Um, a, I, there were many, actually, many hypotheses that were explored around this. One, of course, could be the, sh the prominence that electoral participation gets through our media, um, and, and that perhaps organizations felt that there was enough political mobilization that we didn't need to do it in a meaningful way. Um, and this is interesting because we do see that, uh, you know, turnout for elections, uh, specifically national level, are fairly high um, for us. Um, the second one, of course, could be that a lot of funders want to stay away from, you know, politics and that 
actually has a loop with how organizations function. Um, and the third one was something really interesting, which we heard from a nonprofit where, where they said, look, elections happen once a week. We focus on governance, which is a much longer process. Uh, Thank you, and, I was um, I was just wondering that you know um, do, is there a construct of an archetypal organization that you all were able to distill from the landscaping that you all did, and I just want to also acknowledge the fact that this landscape um, is such a vibrant and um, you know giant tapestry that the value chain doesn't the value chain and the linkages don't always uh, suggest themselves but from what we've seen over our work is that there are um, many interesting possibilities of co-creation collaboration within organizations i just want to call out a few that we've seen in the past so for example reap benefit and e governments foundation have been collaborating on doing some work in 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 in, uh, in, in bringing more of the citizen voice to government services and platforms uh, and similarly um, there have been many such partnerships from within this ecosystem to leverage unique strengths uh, and co-create um, new new pathways forward to amplify citizens' agency and participation. Uh, but Anurathi Shraddha would love to see what uh, what what the distillation and this the, the idea of an archetype might look like from your conversations and work. Absolutely. Um, if we can just move two slides down. Uh, we can talk about this very quickly. Um, I think that the line on the top really talks about this. A typical organization from the ones we looked at work in urban settings. Uh, they deal with primarily 18 to 30 year olds. They are gender and sector agnostic, and they work at the national scale. Um, and I'll very quickly speak to uh, perhaps some of the reasons and rationale that really drove this. Um, so 84% of the organizations are working in urban areas, and this could actually be a function of connectivity um, in some ways. Uh, it could also be a function of a founder bias. Um, so a lot of the founders that we've spoken to have, have been from cities, and, and hence uh, that's what's led to it. Um, An other interesting piece that came out was um, that there was limited uh, gender intentionality so far. Uh, and I think this was something that we discussed at um, the convening as well. And I think the broad question is that it's recognized, but really what does uh, a gender lens look like, right? So if technology is a powerful way in which solutions are being conducted, do we need to look at uh, the user interface for men and women uh, and create solutions accordingly? A third aspect of this, this was uh, looking at the age group. Uh, and interesting because we've seen engagement at a slightly older age group than we see, which is 18 to 30 year old being kind of the median uh, level, which is different from how we've seen uh, interventions perhaps in education or in, in several other spaces. Um, just, I think, two more components of this. Uh, one is there is uh, a fair amount of horizontal focus, not vertical focus. Um, and by horizontal focus, we, we're really talking about uh, saying people want to build a specific type of muscle that then can be used across spaces. Um, there, is a, there is a kind of counter argument that is, that is growing where um, a lot of organizations are starting to feel that we need to entrench people in issues that they care about, um, uh, which is something that's being explored. Um, and I think the final piece to really discuss here uh, is that uh, a lot of the, and this is something that we've talked about um, in internally, is that almost 50% of the organizations have a national focus, and a lot of that is enabled um, through technology. Um, and I think we'll be speaking about that at the at the CAST session tomorrow in detail. Um, but Shraddha, let me hand back over to you um, to kind of talk about some of the forces. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, okay. so like we thought of these forces at two levels, right? Like there are forces which are playing out in the individual context. And then there are some uh, forces which are shaping the overall uh, environment, the macro environment, uh, so to speak. Uh, I'm going to just quickly uh, run through like a couple of things that I thought were interesting to call out. One, we've already discussed, and it is uh, alluded to this, but like I think we live in a world where like our positions are becoming more and more entrenched and like we're moving to a world of binaries with very little uh, or there's a lack of common ground and i think trina uh, uh, spoke to this uh, very beautifully when we interacted with her on saying it's not just like a difference of opinion it's now become an intolerance 
of a difference of opinion, which I thought was very powerful. And the second trend, I think technology, which has really disrupted both uh, at an individual level. I live in Bangalore. I may not know my neighbors that well, but I am a part of many digital communities, whether it's for working mothers, whether it's for cooking or whether it's for K-pop and K-drama. Uh, and therefore, like in this context, when let's say a lot of the active citizenship space has evolved from community organizing, from communities uh, taking charge in this digital world that we inhabit, like what is a community kind of that itself has started changing what it means to be in a community. And the second piece I want to call out is I think our definition of action is also changing. There's a lot of interesting uh, research on clicktivism and slacktivism. And there's a very interesting quote that I would like to paraphrase that by the very passive nature of how we click on a campaign, the essence of active uh, citizenship or activism is kind of lost. And there's a lot of research coming out globally, at least, that you know people are signing up for campaigns and they may not even understand uh, the issue because um, uh, like it's just that sense of you know I've done my bit, I have shared like I've supported a cause and that's kind of driving let's say a lot of the uh, engagement and i think we all saw this in covid with the in like the large number of whatsapp forwards that we were all like i think like we were all flooded with in terms of what to do what not to do every day there was a new uh, nuska a new therapy on uh, what to try and uh, the third is i think at an individual level there's just an implied trust deficit uh, with the Sarkar and I think that's some muscle memory that has been built uh, over repeated interactions with the government system uh, and for example whether it's why is my surname not different uh, is my, whether why my surname is different from my husband's and I've had that conversation with the passport office many times uh, and like that just takes some time to build and also the fact that like some of these things take so long to happen that like as a citizen or as an individual, it's really hard to kind of understand or see like where if I even, let's say, contribute my time and effort, what will it lead to, right? So some of that still remains very hazy. The second thing, uh, uh, like on the institutional side, again, I think technology's played a huge role. It's made a lot of this work very accessible for many of us. And I think uh, uh, here I want to talk to the fact that like, Let's say, for example, like the work that Civis is doing, right, where they are allowing citizens to participate and give feedback on bills. But the fact that a bill to a law takes about 2000 days in India is where, like, I think a lot of the uh, uh, drop off happens and it becomes harder to figure out what is happening and how do I keep people engaged. Uh, the uh, other thing I think uh, I would like to speak to is funding. Uh, again, I, this is coming from the convening where like funding was the top, uh, 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 I would say, issue that almost all the 30 people who were in the room at the internal convening kind of brought up on saying it's very hard. And that is kind of backed up by uh, uh, the fact that I think less than 1% of philanthropic money finds its way into democracy and citizenship work uh, in uh, India. And uh, this is like driven by some I think some of this is very structural because increasingly philanthropy is being driven by measurable outcomes and like we discussed it is very like this sector is so complex like what does an activate who is an activated citizen I think like we are going to come to that slide and you'll find that there's no one definition what does he or she do what does he or she look like where does he or she live there's just no common answer to this there's no linear pathway as well. Like while we may have like some broad, hairy goal of saying, you know, what we hope to achieve, but the pathways, there are just a multitude of ways in which uh, we can uh, get there. And the, the uh, yeah, uh, and I actually got them. It would be good to hear from you also on some of these. I think we've like had a little bit of a back and forth, but I think it will be great for the audience also to kind of, uh, your your thoughts and thinking on you know whether it's non the non binary piece of active citizenship, whether it's the non linearity, anything that you would like to speak to. 
Thanks, Radha. Um, so very quickly, over the course of the last few years, I've, as we've explored this work and worked with some amazing partners to understand what the components of this are. Um, first, um, while there are many, just to focus on two, I think. Have um, you lost Gautam? No, I'm here. Um, uh, Sorry, can you not hear me? Shada, are you, is Gautam audible for you? Yeah, he's audible for me. Oh, okay. okay. Um, so broadly, I think you know the bits that have uh, that have really stood out is the diversity of options that um, that every actor in the ecosystem has to be able to play this. Um, so it's not an it's not you either do practice active citizenship or you don't. I think there's there's a, there's an entire space for it, and I think that's the part that uh, to answer Nikhil's question that um, you know in, impact consulting firms and other organizations can think about. How do you enable information dissemination? How do you build uh, help? amplifying vo voices? How do you build networks? Um, in a sense, how do you help Samaj mobilize better to solve problems as we saw during COVID? How do you enhance the ability for Samaj to make better claims of existing systems like the work that Indus Action does? Um, and then, you know, like, the journey EGAV is on, how do you help um, and support the Sarkar to serve better? I think broadly, um, you know, these are some of the uh, ideas that we've seen, and they're not linear in the sense that you don't have to start with one and then work your way up a ladder. You can choose any one of these. Um, and the idea of the non-binary nature of active citizenship is that, you know, it's uh, it's, it, it's different at different points in time. Um, and, and, and a citizen can choose to be active and engaged on particular problems, but not on all. And that for us was an important um, learning as well. The, the the last one I think for us to uh, really take away, you know, was the role was the role of um, what everyone can do. And I think for us the idea of what Anurathi had mentioned of muscles was the fact that every organization can choose to build some of these muscles into their work. You don't have to do all of them, but building some of them into your work. Uh, gives you a greater ability to engage not just with Samaj, but also more meaningfully to co-create some of these some, some of the solutions to the problems that um, uh, that, that that you tackle. Um, so yeah, um, the the idea that it's non-binary is that you know you can be engaged on some but not on all. Uh, the idea that it's non-linear was was an interesting one for us because we've heard this I, the, we've heard this ladder of engagement that you start in one place and then slowly move up, but it's not true. Um, you can choose to engage very deeply on some things even though you haven't been um, uh, even though you have not necessarily on this ladder of engagement. Um, I just want to hand over. Um, you, you know, if if I, I see a couple of questions in the in in, in the chat box. Um, I think we've answered, Nikhil. There's one from uh, from uh, Parikshit who says social media platforms are powerful platforms for active citizenship and how do these networks play out in the scheme of things? Shraddha, do you want to... Uh, uh, it came up, I know, in the research. You want to talk about that and then we can... Yeah. And uh, uh, Parikshit, that's like a very important conversation to have, I think, in the times uh, uh, that uh, we live in. And there's a lot of research coming out even globally in terms of, you know, what has been the impact of social media and how we think of ourselves as citizens and how we engage uh, and move, like let's say mobilize as uh, Samaj and uh, and like I think there's like the positive sides obviously are immense like I said right like technology some of these platforms have made so much of this work information so accessible for so many of us that like you cannot undermine the important importance of these platforms but then again I think there's a growing uh, epidemic around fake news uh, i think these are all forces like i think these are some challenges that we are going to have to contend with or tackle uh, and there i think globally at least there's and even within india i think there is a lot of conversation now on public commons when it comes to technology and uh, social media so i think those conversations will get louder will get more rich uh, as uh, time moves on but yeah like i think like the just the sheer enablement that these platforms have uh, provided, I think, has been immense. Parikshit, uh, I heard this good analogy that you see social me social media is the beachhead and not the entire map. Uh, that you use social media to activate and bring people on, but it cannot be all of your work. 
um, that that is a starting point and, and a foothold. There are a couple of other questions that um, I want to pull out from the chat. So one is, how do you assess uh, progress being done by uh, organizations in, um, in, in, in active citizenship? Um, I'm happy to take a crack at it, uh, but um, A, there's no good answer because it's not linear. Um, it's one of those. It's one of those. Um, it's it's one of those ideas where perhaps the process is the progress, uh, because many of these challenges, uh, many of these cha the challenges you're trying to solve are not linear, and the pathways to resolve them are not linear as well. Uh, so the way we look at it is to be able to articulate the role of the. Anurathi, do you want to mute? Sorry, I think there's a bit of feedback coming. Through. Thanks. Um, so we, we try and articulate the role of the individual and the role of the systemic problem in which it's happening. Um, and so, so long as we can very clearly see the pathway from the individual to the system, uh, then it's a little bit of trusting in the process. And the important, the one that we've come to see is so vital is iterating from what you learn. Uh, you can have a hypothesis as to how you can um, influence the system uh, as a citizen, uh, but feedback is important and learning is important and being able to iterate from what you're seeing and observing is very very, very, uh, is, is very, very vital. Um, I, I just want to pick up, uh, Shraddha Anurathi, if you had any answers, I'll go yeah. through the questions. Yeah, quickly, I uh, just adding to what Gautam uh, said, I think, uh, and we have it uh, in green on the slide that's on the screen as well, that I think in this is one space, I think, which where action is far greater than impact. Because just by like taking that action also has a huge meaning and like there's a development of agency there's a development of voice which is so critical to a lot of the work that we're doing across uh, develop the development sector and in trying to tackle india's uh, social problems so yeah like i think and like when we were talking to uh, portfolio organizations when we were looking at research as well i think just saying what like at what point do you consider somebody activated then like once they're activated, do they stay activated? And then activating to what end, right? Like there are no clear answers for any of these questions. And therefore, when you're trying to, uh, when you're trying to measure impact, then it becomes very tough if you don't know what success looks like, right? Uh, uh, so yeah, right? Uh, just building on that. So yeah. Anurathi, did you have anything to add? You're on mute. You're on mute, Anurathi. I, um, I, uh, hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll, uh, yeah, while I still can. So I think there were two things uh, that we heard. One was someone said this at the convening, which is what is an end state, right? There is no perfect ideal state um, that we're ever working towards. Um, so I think that is a really powerful piece. The second is we've, we've talked about this a lot, um, a lot internally, uh, which is that there is a, almost a funnel that you can think of where the minute you move from asking people to do what Shraddha was saying, which is, you know, click on a link, um, uh, to actually spending their time, uh, there is a huge drop off. So I think for for one of the organizations we'd spoken to, that number went from somewhere like 600,000 to people who click links to 3,000 to 4,000 who actually spend time. Um, and I think these are some of the real challenges around um, uh, to your to your point in terms of you know how do we move forward? Hmm. Yeah. And I think Uttara makes a very interesting uh, uh, comment saying that, you know, a variety of organizations working with a multitude of stakeholders need to collaborate if we really need to see the needle shift. And I think Uttara, that speaks to what has come out for us as well, saying that this is not like this, this is not like a vertical. So it's not like education or health or let's say wash. This is actually a horizontal and none of the work that we are seeing in any of these sectors would be successful if, let's say, if communities did not take ownership of their problem, uh, you know, like assert uh, their uh, voice or their rights uh, as citizens. And we've seen this, like, like this participatory or collaborative problem solving time and again in different sectors, whether it's uh, the school management committees uh, in education or it's Kudumshri uh, in Kerala, or even the ward committees that are active now in many of our cities. So these are all like, I think, 
fantastic examples of how you know people everyday people of india everyday people like you and i can come together and are showing up day after day for our uh, communities um while we take the last couple of questions what i'd love is for everyone if they just want to put into the chat uh, something they learned from the um, session today or questions they would like uh, answered in some point in time in the future uh, so nikhil to, to your question on did you come across any forms of active citizenship where the engagement got embedded into samaj um, you know if you look at so if you look at for example the idea of uh, in karnataka what they call the katte which is the which is the common meeting space or meeting ground for conversations um, in a in a way that is that is something that we care deeply about right the idea that there are common spaces where everyone can talk about their um, hopes and aspirations and understand their understand each other's interests so that we can move forward the breaking the binaries you know, many of these you know many of these practices existed i mean part of the research um to, is you know gandhi gandhi's idea of the village as a self organizing unit is very very powerful in terms of active citizenship but perhaps some of the, our work is really to tap back into these ideas and practices that we had but have lost um and uh, uh, Dan uh, dananjay has a question about are there certain states or geographies versus others where this idea is more where the idea of active citizenship is more rooted i will say that uh, we we have a little bit of a bias towards a more urban uh, context in this work but that's 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 the limitations of uh, our limitations not that of the work i'm sure it's vibrant and the research will will throw up more of that that's happening outside of um, urban centers um Samir has a question. Um, Samir has a question on: Do people underside underside the upsides of participation, especially nth order ones? Um, Samir, I'm not sure I fully understood the question, but but if it's around the fact, do do people not fully value what participation does? um my answer is yes people don't uh, because it's a very powerful tool uh, for co-creation uh, for self actualization and for ownership i mean all three of them right i mean if you participate in the co-creation of a solution you 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 take both moral obligation and responsibility but a sense of some some sort of sense of ownership in that so we just love to hear from um shraddha and anurathi on that Uh, and again just to say if you guys want to throw um, comments into the chat box on what you might take away from this conversation and bits that are still unclear we'll use that to iterate um, for for future uh, pieces of knowledge yeah so i think uh, just got them just speaking to that point on you know does it differ across states we haven't like really arrived at an answer to this but what we did see is that there is some correlation between like the trust between the citizens and the government so i think it does speak to that element so where you will like states where you tend to see a very high incumbency uh, factor you will see uh, some of these constructs playing out very differently uh, so that i think from a geography context we did see uh uh and there was one more question got them i think you had wanted us to uh uh, uh answer um one was uh, certain geographies and states in which uh, there's more of more visible active citizenship um there was one on um, have we seen active citizenship become embedded into samaj where the organization is no longer required and then samir's question on um what's it called um, the upsides of participation um if you all want to touch upon yeah. any of those briefly uh, and i think rti I think is a brilliant example of where let's say what was let's say mkss like what like what what was a movement from samaj which is now embedded like all of us as citizens know that it is our right and we can file an rti there are a lot of organizations like helping us to do that but like it is something that is available to us i think in the research that we came across and just speaking to the saying benefits of participation uh in the research that we ca we came across that it is it does have instrumental benefit to you as an individual and there's obviously benefit to your communities and there's benefit to like just participating in democracy as a whole but even for an individual there are benefits in terms of you know like there's a strong correlation between how active you are in your communities and social capital and then social capital further has a direct linkage to success uh as well 
Thank you, Shraddha. Um, I, in the interest of time, uh, we're running very, very tight sessions. We're going to wrap up now. I want to thank uh, Anurati and Shraddha for bringing the learnings they've been uh, distilling and synthesizing for a month now. Um, and then over the course of the next few weeks, we'll be able to publish this. Um, and I'm sure we'll find a way to get it out to all of you. Thank you for being such an engaged and active audience. Um, if there are questions we weren't able to answer or uh, things that we have missed and you would like to talk to us about, uh, we'd love to stay in touch. Um, there's a contact button um, on somewhere on AirMeet uh, as well as uh, on our website. Thank you, everyone, and we'll see you. Look forward to seeing many of you in this course of the eight sessions we have planned over the next three days. Thank you. Any chance, Yash, that we could look at the video? We have, I think, five minutes. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah.